So last week when we were going through the answers for the homework, I said that I would go back and check the five items that we didn't find on page 19. Turns out the textbook was being too picky. In fact, there are only 14 real grammar mistakes and we caught them all, so don't worry about that. Now, the previous week's homework was on page 26. It says, some of these 20 are wrong. Okay, let's see. The first mistake is in the title. Dollar clothing. It just means that the clothing can be bought for a dollar. Oh no, it said in the underlined parts. OK, so let's not screw with the title. OK, so it's not how you type. I'm using two hands and I still can't type. Surprisingly comfortable suits for work and leisure. Easy to clean polyester. Polyester is artificial fabric. In real varied colors, real is correct. Goes from the office grind to the so office grind is also correct to the extremely bright club scene without a pause. So the idea is that these suits work in the workplace and when you're partying. Fast track jacket. Hmm. I think that works. A track jacket is um, it's like a sports wear jacket, right? With the zipper. Ring don't white hall. Yeah, let's say that works. A fast track jacket that works. Stun your coworkers with an astonishing elegance of deep eggplant. Uh, eggplant here is the color. Jesus. Gentle curves follow a real natural outline to accentuate your figure. Accentuate just means to highlight. The silky lining in delightful loud shades of orange. We talked about loud last week gives a strong message. I am woman. Hear me roar, said Katy Perry. OK, soft woven pants coordinate with the jacket described above. Right, it's saying this specific jacket. And with everything in your wardrobe in eggplant orange or eggplant orange plaid. Plaid is squares. Good. OK, that's it. Questions? So if you're interested in fashion and talking about fashion, this page has a lot of language that you can learn to describe clothing and the experience of wearing clothing and the color and things like that. 27. Put the adverb in, paren in yeah, parentheses in its usual mid-sentence position. Sue always takes a walk in the morning. 
OK, so the usual position is somewhere near whatever the adverb describes. If it describes a specific word like an adjective or a verb, it will go either before or after that word. If it describes a whole sentence, usually it begins. Sorry, it's usually placed at the very beginning. So let's take a look. Number two. Tim is always a hard worker. The always describes is. It's not describing how hard he works, right? Not it's not describing hard. It's describing the frequency with which this sentence is true. When is it true? When is it not true? And the answer is it is always true. So it's describing the is. Number three, same thing. Beth has always worked hard. Number four. Was that quieter? You'll be a shouse now. How's that? Still kind of loud. Hello. Okay, let's let's use this. Number four. Jack always works hard. Number five. Do you always work hard? Number six. Taxis are usually available at the airport. So you can see that this section is all about putting the adverb somewhere in the middle of the sentence. But it says that this is the usual position. So when would you have to use a less usual position? If another adverb is in or near that position in the sentence because it is describing a specific word right next to it, then you might need to put the big sentence level adverb somewhere else to avoid confusion. Uh, so far we have not seen this situation. So Yusuf rarely takes a taxi to his office. I have often thought about quitting my job and sailing to Alaska. Yuko probably needs some help. Have you ever attended the show at the Museum of Space? Ever means once before. So you can think of it as the opposite of never. Never means not once. So the opposite of that is at least once. Al seldom goes out to eat at a restaurant. The students are hardly ever late. Do you usually finish your homework before dinner? In India, the monsoon season or the rainy season generally begins in April. During the monsoon season, Mr. Singh's hometown usually receives around 610 centimeters or 240 inches of rain, which is an unusually large amount. OK, do you have questions about this page? If you don't put the adverb in this exact position, I'm not going to get mad. Right, adverbs are very flexible, but because you're describing the main verb of each sentence, it should be somewhere near the main verb. 
Like it shouldn't be too far away. Page 28. Ah, so it doesn't tell you what the errors are or how many they are. Very interesting. So that means this is slightly harder than our final exam. OK, number one, by obeying the speed limit, we can save energy, lives, and it costs us less. Hmm. OK, it should be energy and lives, and it costs us less. Why? I'm wondering if we've other, already covered this. Hmm. Clear with the forest and plan. So if this is about punctuation, we haven't talked about punctuation yet. OK, what what did I say to do for homework? All the way up to page. 31, right? Yeah. OK, sure, so let's keep going. Uh, and if it has to do with something we haven't talked about yet, keep it in mind. So in this case, it's better this way because. You're listing or the sentence is trying to list three things. Energy lives, these both are nouns, but the third item is a whole sentence, so it doesn't fit into the list. So these two are parallel, right? Energy and lives. And the next, the last item is a complete sentence. Uh, so it's OK as it is right here. But this comma needs to be and. Number two, my home offers me a feeling of security, warmth, and love. Warm is an adjective, you need a noun. Number three, the pioneers hope to clear away the forest and plant crops. It's parallel, right? To do two things, to clear and to plant. But these two are parallel. Number four, when I refused to help Alice, she became very angry and shouted at me. Again, became is past tense and parallel shouted, past tense. Number five, when Nadia moved, she had to rent an apartment, make new friends, and find a job. Uh, another question about parallelism. Either you repeat the word to for all three items, or you only use it for the first item and then omit it for the second and third items. Here it tried to do both. You need to pick one. Number six, all plants need light to have a suitable climate and an ample supply of water and minerals from the soil. OK, so it looks like it's trying to list three nouns, so we need to change the middle one. All plants need light, a suitable climate, and an ample supply of water, blah, blah, blah. Number seven, slowly and cautiously, the firefighter climbed the, I'm going to say burning staircase. Burn staircase could also work, right? Imagine the house was on fire, but the fire has been extinguished, but the house is still dangerous, right? You don't know what has been burned away. You don't know if this staircase will collapse. So it does make sense, but I do think burning staircase is probably the more common situation. Uh, and of course, in the at the beginning, these have to be parallel adverb with adverb. Number eight on my vacation, I lost a suitcase, broke my glasses 
and I miss my flight home. So the last one should be and missed. You're connecting three verb phrases. You're omitting the repeated I, right? You also, it's also I broke my glasses, but the I has been omitted. So here you should also omit the I. Number nine, with their keen sight, fine hearing, and refined sense of smell, wolves hunt elk, deer, moose, and caribou. Right, okay, so this is the only mistake. Again, parallel, uh, three kinds of things. Now you might be thinking, so all of these are uncountable nouns? And the answer is yes, because it's not talking about individual animals, it's talking about abstract species of animals. And also to the wolf, these are all food. And we know that different kinds of food are not countable. 10, when Anna moved, wait, is it repeating a question? <laughs> Oh, yeah, so they just changed the person's name <laughs> from Nadia to Anna. OK, so you know the answer to number 10. 11. The Indian cobra snake and the king cobra. Use poison from their fangs in two ways. By injecting it directly into their prey. Or. This should be parallel, right? Spitting it into the eyes of the victim. I would also change that to their victim, right? Their prey, their victim. Personally, I would also omit the um, word snake. Because um, I think we all know that a cobra is a kind of snake, right? Did you guys know that a cobra is a kind of snake? You should know. Let's say you all know this, so you don't need the word snake. OK, questions about page 28. OK. Page 29. 11 mistakes in the use of present time verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. The first one is already corrected. Find 10 more. Okay. No cell phone restrictions. It seems that I constantly hear the same thing. Cell phones are dangerous. We need to restrict them. People are dying because of cell phones. Well, I'm thinking cell phones themselves aren't the problem. I'm completely opposed to restrictions on them, and here's why. First, people say cell phones are dangerous to health. Supporters of this idea say that cell phones produce harmful radiation and that they can even cause cancer. OK, we're going to talk about this next semester, but basically. Uh, the word say has two sentences as its objects. Say that A and that B. So it's another question of parallelism. Both sentences that follow the word say should begin with the word that. Continuing, they say that many studies have proven this. I think this is nonsense. There hasn't been any real proof. All those studies don't mean anything. Second, teachers don't allow cell phones in classes because they're a distraction. I feel pretty angry about this. Cell phones can save lives. Here's an example. Two weeks ago in my history class, a student had his cell phone on. 
he always keeps it on because his mother doesn't speak English and sometimes she needs his help. His mother did call that day and she had an emergency. She had to call someone to help her. What if the phone hadn't been on? I think this the is acceptable. Personally, I would say his phone, but in this context, we know which phone we're talking about, so I think it's fine. Third, people argue that using a cell phone while driving is dangerous. This idea sounds crazy to me. It isn't more dangerous than turning on the car radio or eating a sandwich. People are allowed to do those things when they drive. The law says you have to have one hand on the steering wheel at all times. It's possible to use a cell phone correctly with one hand. If you know how to drive well, you can do this easily. This has always been a free country. I hope it stays that way. OK, how many is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Great, we got them all. Questions? I want to draw your attention to this one. If I can find it. The the here. I feel pretty angrily about this. This should be adjective angry. In English, when you ask someone their feelings, you don't say what do you feel? You say, how do you feel? And the answer is, I feel angry, adjective. This, I think, is different from in Chinese. In Chinese, we talk about emotions as if they are nouns. But in English, we usually use adjectives for emotions. So many people will think that when you ask someone their feeling, you should say, what do you feel? But in fact, the real way to ask this in English is, how do you feel? This is important because I asked this question in one of my classes exams. And I want you to understand the question. I'm not going to tell you which class, because then I would be giving away the exam question and that would be cheating. OK, next page, page 30. Six mistakes. My neighbor Jeff is a teacher. His job is going well in general, which means no problem so far. And he likes it. But sometimes he sounds again, sounds angry. When he talks about it, he feels frust fr frustrated because a few students in his class behave poorly. Note that the answer is not badly. Badly means very much. So I'm very thirsty. I badly need a drink of water. It has nothing to do with good or bad. They pretend to listen to him and they look quiet. Quiet, this should be quiet. Quiet and innocent in class. But they don't take their studies seriously. Instead, they surf the internet and text each other during class. Well, at least they're not playing League of Legends. OK, that's six. Do you have questions about this one? OK, I think this is the last one, right? Yeah. No, 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 uh, two more. OK, bottom of page 30. 
<laughs> and it has a warning. Do not actually try these yoga positions at home. This is simply for practicing English, not actual yoga advice. 10 errors caused by vague, misplaced or dangling descriptions. OK, so anything that is unclear and there should be 10 of them. Yoga and yaw, an excerpt. Uh, yaw, I don't know if you've seen this contraction before. Y'all is you all, um, and is the plural form of you. So this is used especially in the American South. That way, it's more clear when you say you, whether you mean you one person or you all of you. In the Midwest, they say you guys. Uh, also, the plural form of you. OK, yoga and y'all, an excerpt. If you only learn one yoga posture, this should be it. Even beginners can do it. If you put the even here, you're describing the do. Beginners can even do it. So they're not expected to do it. Doesn't make sense. You're saying even beginners can do it. To form the greeting turtle posture, the mat should extend from knees to armpits. Freshly laundered. OK, OK, so. The mat. Freshly laundered and dry to fluffiness should extend from knees to armpits. Laundered means washed. Fluffy means soft. So you're describing the mat. You're not describing the body parts. Right, otherwise mat is here and the description is here. It's too far away. While bending the right knee up to the nose, the left ankle relaxes. You should almost bend the knee for OK. You should bend the knee for almost a minute. Right, it's not saying almost bend. It's saying almost a minute. Before straightening it again. Throw your head back now. OK, I would put the now in front. You're describing the whole sentence. Now throw your head back. Extending each muscle to its fullest. Only breathing two or three times before returning the head to its original position. Tucking the chin close to the collarbone, the nose should wiggle. Finally. OK, this this is a mistake. Tucking the chin close to the collarbone, you should wiggle your nose. We're going to talk about this next semester, but if you begin a sentence with a subordinate clause beginning ing without a subject, the subject is in fact the subject of the main sentence after the comma. In this case, the subject of the main sentence is the nose, but you cannot use your nose to tuck your chin in. So shaba. It has to be you, right? You tuck your chin, you wiggle your nose. So you have to put the you into the sentence. Finally, raise the arms to the sky. OK, the sky that is blue. And bless the yoga posture. That doesn't make sense. OK, I think what it's trying to say is raise the arms and bless the sky that is blue. No, 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 it is. That is what it's trying to say. OK. Uh, sky that is blue and bless the yoga posture, whatever that means. The grammar is correct. It's the meaning that's weird. 
How OK, how many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're missing four. OK. I'm starting to not like this textbook. You know what? I know what the problem is. All of these like the. Oh, where is it? The right knee. All of these should be your your right knee, your nose, your left ankle, your knee. I bet that's the big issue, right? Your head. This is correct. Um, but all of the other body parts, your chin, your nose, your arms. Let's just say that's the answer. Uh, because it is talking to a specific reader. So using your instead of the is more personal. You build a stronger relationship with your reader. If you take my writing course next year, you will understand better what I'm talking about. OK, do you have other questions about this page? OK, page 31. Comparisons, OK. 15 errors. You might have to rewrite an entire sentence. What fun. Vote for Sally. Sally will be the. OK, so most people will say you cannot say most unique because unique means different from anybody and everything else. But in fact, you can say most unique. Because there are levels of difference. So for example, the word perfect. Perfect means there's nothing wrong with whatever it is. So it looks like you can't say more perfect, right? Because perfect is nothing wrong. How can you have more or less of nothing wrong? But in fact, more perfect appears in the United States Constitution. And in this case, perfect means close to perfect. So when you say more perfect, you mean closer to perfect. Same thing here. You cannot be more or less like unique, but you can be various levels of difference from other people. So I'm going to bet you that the textbook says this one is wrong, but I will keep it. So we have to look out for 14 other mistakes. The most unique president our grade has ever had for these reasons. Our cafeteria is dirtier than the cafeterias of the other six schools in District 2. When you compare, you cannot compare with yourself. You have to exclude yourself. So it's the other six schools. Another way to write this is. Is the dirtiest of the six schools. Sally is better at organizing school events than her opponents. Sally will collect dues more efficiently compared to Seymour. Oliver was wrong. Again, if you want to, you can say very wrong. Uh, and in that, OK, so like wrong usually cannot be compared. It's like perfect, right? Either you got it right or you did not get it right. But if you say very wrong, that means that the consequences of being wrong are worse. So you're not actually talking about how wrong you are. You're talking about how serious this mistake is. But I bet the textbook will say that this is incorrect, but we'll keep it. So we're now looking for a total of 13 mistakes. Oliver was very wrong when he said that Sally spent class money on herself. The principal thinks Sally is 
more competent than any other candidate. Again, you have to exclude yourself. Seymour is absent more frequently than Sally. The rule for when you have to use the word more instead of adding ER to the end is how many syllables does the word have? Usually. One or two syllables you would end with ER, but three or more syllables you have to use the word more. Frequently three syllables, so more frequently. Then Sally. And Sally is more, I guess. Yeah, more committed to school events. Or maybe you can say very committed. The idea is compared to Seymour, Sally is more committed. Sally's plan for the school field will make it more square. <laughs> OK, and add the best bleachers. So I guess the idea is that she wants a square playing field for some reason. Um, so when it says add the best bleachers, a bleacher is where the audience sits and stands on the side of the playing field. So when it says add the best bleachers, that means that currently there are no bleachers. And so Sally is going to get new ones and they are going to be the best. This is something Donald Trump would say. We have the best people. Um, but assuming that the school already has bleachers. Which is usually the case, then it should be better bleachers. More square. I think this should be square er. It's not a word that I use very often, right? Nobody really cares how square something is. Oliver and Seymour are funnier, but Sally is smarter than anyone else in our class. School paper endorses Sally as aha, very perfect candidate. In this case, I'm going to say that we do have to change this because an endorsement, Beishu, is a very formal announcement. So they would be using the most formal, most correct version of perfect. Very perfect is understandable, but it's not very formal. So let's change this to the perfect candidate. Of all the candidates, Sally gives less boring and shorter speeches. OK, it should be shorter and less boring because we want to avoid the confusion of uh, making the reader think it, that we're saying less shorter. If you put shorter and less boring, it's very clear that less only describes boring. OK, we're looking for 13. How many is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Great, we got them all. Questions? OK, so let's move on to today's lesson. Today's lesson is prepositions. As you can tell from the word, a preposition is a word that you put before a position. And in this case, position is talking about the position of a noun in the sentence. So 
like uh, I'm just give you a, a random example. Right, so in this case, the preposition is the word on because it is describing the position of the main noun and the specific position comes after the word. So the word comes before the position. It's a pre position. Some languages do it the other way around and they have post positions where they give you the location first and then they give you the word. But in English, we put the word first. So a preposition is a word that tells you the specific location or detail of a noun. And there are two main kinds of prepositions. There are prepositions of space and there are prepositions of time. Some words can be used for either one depending on the context. So before we move into the uh, long list of prepositions, I want to point out one key idea. A preposition must always be followed by some kind of noun or noun phrase, right? It has to be a noun in this place in the sentence with one exception. The exception is the word to. To can sometimes be followed by a verb, as we have seen using the infinitive. So at this point, I want to remind you that the part of speech, is it a verb, is it a noun, is it an adjective? Is it a participle? Is it a gerund? Those are not, let's say, scientific categories. They are not immutable. They are not fixed. They are not something you can always depend on. They are only there to help you understand a sentence. But if the part of speech does not make sense, forget it. If the sentence is correct, you have to find some other way to make sense of what you see on the page. So, in this sentence, I want to see the movie Napoleon. The word to is a preposition, but to see is an infinitive. Don't try to make sense of this. Just remember that this is something that happens. And this is the only preposition in English that can be followed by a verb because of this reason. Every other preposition is followed by a noun or noun phrase or a noun with an adjective or a gerund, some kind of word that is can be explained as a noun. By the way, the movie Napoleon is terrible. I did go to see it. Don't go to see it. OK, so uh, I should also warn you that prepositions are, I think, the part of the English language that changes the fastest. Uh, I've been telling you that correct English is defined by how native speakers use the language. If a usage changes, and native speakers agree on the change, they can understand it, they use it, then the language has changed. Prepositions change very fast. So even some of the things that the textbook says, the textbook was published in like, like this century, it was published in like 2021. That was two, let's say two or three years ago, but even the textbook, some things are already out of date. Um, so in the next period, I'm just going to go through the these two lists. The first list is prepositions of space. A few pages later is prepositions of time. I'm going to go through them and I'm going to try to describe what each preposition means 
in language today. The textbook says that English has 40 prepositions. I don't really believe it, but it says there are 40. Oh, there are less than 40, so there are almost 40. I don't think we're going to talk about 40 of them. We're just going to talk about whatever is on this list. OK, let's take a short break.
OK, prepositions. The best way to do this, especially when talking about prepositions of space, is to be like a kindergarten teacher and use objects to perform the word. Um, but I can't do that for the online people, so I have to talk about it. OK, first one across going from one side to the other. Think about going across a river on a bridge. Um, the thing that you are going across, sometimes you will go through. So like to go across the field, the grassy field. In fact, you're going through the field to get from one side to the other, but you can still say across. At is a point. At is an abstract point. Think about a map. Think about Google Maps. Whenever you look for somewhere on Google Maps, it is a point, even if it's actually a building, even if it's actually a whole university, it will only give you one point. And that's what the word at means. It's not telling you the specific location inside this place. It's only telling you this place. So. Um, I OK, so here's when I start typing. I saw her at the movie theater last night. I don't say where in the movie theater. I'm talking about the movie theater as an abstract location. Next one in inside within. This is where we start talking about spatial relations. So if you say in or inside or within, it's always something that you can enter. Either can be an inside or an outside. So if you're talking about something that you cannot enter, you should not use the word in. So like uh, if you say I put my book in the table, then the reader knows that this table has some kind of drawer toti or some kind of compartment gejian. Otherwise, this sentence would be impossible. The opposite is outside or out of. So again, it has to be something that you can enter and now you're saying you are not inside it, you are outside it. On, on to, um, this is where one thing is above another and they are touching. So I put my book on the table, means that the book is like literally on top, it's touching. But this is also often used in an abstract sense to mean about. I presented my report on global warming. In this case, on means about. Next one, from. From means you are taking something away from something else. So I took five dollars from my wallet, Pija. So you are taking something away from something else. This can also be used in an abstract sense. I learned many things from my grammar teacher, hopefully. So from your grammar teacher and everything that he gave you, you took some things. And those things became yours because you learned them. Uh, and this is also why something like. Uh, this you can say. Two from five is three. 
because you are taking two away from five. Next, over and above. These are the same as on, except that they are not touching. So if you say the book is on the table, that means that it is lying there on top of the table. But if you say the book is above the table, that means that it is somewhere higher than the table, but it's not touching the table. So maybe like there is a shelf on the wall. Above the table and the book is on the shelf. The shelf is not touching the table, so the book is above the table. The word over is usually used in a less defined sense. So, OK, let me try to draw this thing. This is above. This is over. You'll notice that it's not always directly above. It is just somewhere higher and near whatever you're describing. Right, so directly above is above, but in a slightly wider range, we can use the word over. Over also has abstract senses, so uh, we argued over the movie Napoleon. So in this case, over means about. Usually if you use over in this sense, you're talking about the specific details of whatever you're discussing. So you might say the pros and cons of the movie Napoleon. So this is the specific thing that you are arguing about. The opposite of over and above is under, underneath, or even beneath. Hmm. OK, so. The the opposite of over is under or underneath. The opposite of above is below or beneath. You can also use the word beneath in a more abstract sense to mean uh, the quality or value is less than or lower than. So. To be beneath me means like, right? Do something that is less worthy of myself. So I won't talk to my enemies. That's beneath me. In Chinese, we would say, OK, next we have through and throughout. If across is to go from one side to the other without caring about what happens in the middle, through is the middle part. Uh, if you cross a river using a bridge, then you go over the river. But if you cross the river by walking into the river, you are going through the river. And then the word throughout means uh, through plus everywhere. So throughout the campus means everywhere on campus.
near is close. The opposite is far. But you can also use near in an abstract sense. Like. Uh, um, you can also use close in an abstract sense. So for example. Um, close is of course an adjective. It was a close guess means that you were wrong, but you were almost right. If you use near, that means uh, your guess was near the mark. You almost guessed right. Along or alongside, you can think of this as with, walking with. Um, yeah, often we say along with, right? Which means um, in addition. Alongside, okay, so for example, a river, you can walk alongside a river. So you're walking next to the river and you keep walking next to the river. Between is you have two things and you're stuck in the middle. In fact, that's what the word literally means. B, tween is two, so you're in the middle of two. The classic example is between a rock and a hard place, which is a dilemma, nanti. OK, um, so those are the main prepositions of space. Now let's look at the prepositions of time. Um, in English, space and time can often be interrelated. So for example, before and after, in terms of time, something happens first, we say uh, before, something happens later, we say after. But you can also use before to mean in front of, uh, in a spatial sense. So, um, a whole new world lies before you. In this case, before means in front of you. After can also mean resembling. So. I wrote a poem after the style of William Wordsworth. After means resembling, like. By. In terms of time, the word by means before the end of. So if I say by tomorrow, that means before the end of tomorrow. By, of course, can also mean the person who does something, especially in a passive voice. Right, by myself. I'm the one who did it. Yes. Okay, so the question is what is the tense of the sentence that ends with by tomorrow. There really is no specific rule about this because. Um, especially if you're telling, OK, let me give you some examples. OK, so the most common one is an order. Cheese a imperative. Please do it by tomorrow, right? So there's no real tense, it's imperative. But also, she asked me to do it by tomorrow. 
in this case, tomorrow is referring to the time of the speaker, not the time of she. So, so for example, yesterday she asked me to do it by tomorrow. This is the first day. This is the third day. Right, this is the third day, not the third day. It's the third day. Because if it's the second day, you would say by the following day. The word tomorrow is talking about when the person is talking now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're talking, if you say tomorrow, today, you're still referring to the next day, not according to when the order was given. And then you can also use the future, right? Um, you will, uh, you will try to finish it by tomorrow, but you will fail. So this has not begun yet. So the answer to your question is it depends on context. But that is a good question because once you talk about time in English, it can get kind of confusing. Sure, after. After having lunch, James is thinking about taking a nap. Yeah, you can say after lunch because lunch is a noun. You can also say after having lunch because having is a gerund. And a gerund is a verb that is used as a noun. OK, great. Um, so we talked about by. Next is in, in the spatial, uh, sorry, in the temporal sense. In means uh, it will happen after a set period of time. So I'm going to give you a test in two weeks. So after waiting for two weeks, the thing will happen. At, once again, at is an abstract point in time. It is a very specific moment in time. So that's why we say things like at 3 p.m. It's a very specific moment. At 3.13 p.m. even. So if you use a word like Monday, you don't say at. You say on. On Monday, because Monday is a whole day. It's not a specific point in time. Um, so for example, in at Mingchuan, we talk about week one, week two. Uh, the way to talk about this is on week 15. And the reason you use on is because we're not talking about the whole week. We're talking about the class meeting during that week. So it's still one day. OK, since. Means uh, after it happened. So. Usually it's uh, preceded by the word ever. So. Uh, I've loved you ever since. I first saw you. So this happened. Uh, and then this happened. 
you can say after, but since has a causal relation. It, it's a cause and effect relationship. After does not have a cause and effect relationship. For expresses purpose. So like this is a gift for your help. I'm giving you this gift because of your help. Um, or this is a message for Tom. The purpose is to get the message to Tom. During is while something is happening. Uh, so please be quiet during the exam is while the exam is happening. Please be quiet. And then the last one until is something that a lot of Taiwanese students use incorrectly. Until means it has been the case before, but after this point it has changed. So. Don't call me until tomorrow. In this case, can you call me tomorrow? No. Yes. Don't call me before tomorrow, but once we get to that point, things change. In Chinese, we say, 直到点点点才. So uh, if you want to say that nothing changes even tomorrow, you would say uh, don't call me even tomorrow. In that case, it means even when we get to tomorrow, still do not call me. But if you say until tomorrow, that means when we get to tomorrow, everything changes. OK, um, we had to stay in the classroom until the bell rang. So after the bell rings, do you have to stay in the classroom? No, because when you get to that point and you use the word until everything after that point changes. So if you want to say that you have to stay in the room after the bell rings, you have to say even after the bell rang. And in that case, that means you have to stay after the bell. Sure, so you're saying like not until tomorrow can you call me. Same uh, logic. Here, let me. Let me let me show you not right. This not. Can you is saying ability. In this case, it's imperative. So the ability is already implied. And then call me, call me until everything else is the same. So this sentence is the same as this sentence. So like don't is the same as you can't. So you, sorry, you, you, can, can, not, not, call me until tomorrow, so call I me until tomorrow. Yes. So these two sentences are exactly the same. It's the attitude that's different. Or I guess in English we say it's the mood, qi that's different. Right, I feel like 
even though these are the lists given by our textbook, I'm missing a few. Uh, we have other prepositions, but we don't have a list, so I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, we can talk about these so-called other prepositions. There should be something else, right? Okay, yeah, let's talk about these other prepositions. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. We we do have to talk about the word too. Uh, the word too appeared in the first list, actually. I skipped it. Here, too. So if you're using to as a very ordinary preposition followed by a noun, it's talking about the end goal, or in terms of space, the end location. Go to your room, right? This is where you will end up. Um, two has some variations. So in this case, a room is a space that you can enter. So you can say go into your room. The difference is that if I'm saying this to my kid to punish them, right? Go to your room, stay there, be quiet, don't come out. The point is my kid is there. I don't care about the inside or the outside. It's just the place. But if I say go into your room, look under your bed and find the Christmas present that I left you, then I care about the space. First you enter the room, then you look under the bed. So it's a difference in emphasis. And then you have like. Onto. Climb onto the table. Um, so two here expresses action. It was you were not on the table. But you climb onto the table. Something has changed. So two is the preposition of change. You were not in your room. Now you are in your room. You were not on the table. Now you are on the table. Uh, English can form many different uh, prepositions using the word to, but these are the most common. Um, oh, speaking of to, throw the ball. Sorry, it's right here. Um, it's somewhere. OK, here. I threw the ball to John, which means I'm giving John the ball through the air. But I threw a cup at John, means I'm using the cup as a weapon to try to hit John. Like at, so to, Again, two is about a specific end point. The, the goal is to reach John so that John can catch the ball. If I don't care whether John catches the cup, I will use at. Because at is a specific point. It is not necessarily an intentional goal. So another example of this is. I shouted to Sarah and I shouted at Sarah. Why does this keep happening to me? I shouted to Sarah and I shouted at Sarah. So I shouted to Sarah means I'm trying to tell her something and she's like far away, so I have to be loud. I want Sarah to receive my message. Sarah is the goal of my message. But if I say I shouted at Sarah, that means I'm very mad at her. I'm trying to express my anger in the general direction of Sarah. I don't care if she understands. I don't care if she responds. I just want her to hear what I'm shouting. So at is, a, is an abstract point. Sarah is now not being treated as a person. She's being treated as a direction, as a point. So I shouted to Sarah, don't forget your keys. 
but I shouted at Sarah, how could you make such a mistake? Right there, you can see the difference. OK, what are the other weird prepositions? Against. Did we talk about against before? No. OK, against has two meanings. The more common meaning is to oppose, right? Be against this idea means to be opposed to. You think it's a bad idea. The other original meaning is to put your weight on to push against. And if you think about it, you can see why these two are the same word. When you oppose something, it's like the two sides are going against each other, right? It's like they're going in the opposite directions at each other. Just like when you push against the door, according to Newton, the door is also pushing against you. Yeah, you can lean against the wall. Um, Today we might say I pushed on the door, but that doesn't really make sense because on is a, a, like a vertical relationship, but the door is a horizontal relationship. So you can say I lean. OK, so like if I say I leaned on the table versus I leaned against the table, these are two different pictures. To lean on the table means I'm like on top of the table and I'm pushing on down onto the table. But if I say I lean against the table, it's like I'm standing and like uh, my butt is touching the table, right? The direction is horizontal as is shaping the guanxi. So for everyone in the classroom right now, I can do a short performance. Uh, like. This is leaning on the table. This is leaning against the table. Right on is a vertical relationship against is a horizontal relationship. OK, next one among you use among just like between, but there's more than two. So between two of my friends and among three of my friends. More than two use among. By. We talked about by in terms of time. We talked about by in terms of person, um, but you can also use by in terms of space. I uh, went to the 7-Eleven by my house. So in fact, by means near to. Or sometimes you will say next to, like right next door. Uh, we talked about four. Did I, I think I told you about um, to me versus for me, right? I think we talked about this. Yes. Okay, I'll help. I'll refresh your memory. To me is to my thinking. I'm thinking about this. I'm analyzing this and my conclusion is. For me is about my experience. If I put myself in this situation, how will I feel? So you might say. To me. Napoleon was a terrible movie. And then I give you some reasons. But if I say for me, Napoleon was a terrible movie, I will share my experience. So the first one, Napoleon was a terrible movie. 
the lighting was too dark, the editing was too slow. These are all reasons. But if I say for me, Napoleon was a terrible movie. Um, I did not enjoy it. I thought it was boring. Uh, I thought that um, the the acting was not interesting, right? These are experiences. Mm. Right. I'm thinking if I can give a better example, but nothing is coming to mind at the moment. OK, how about this? To me, grammar class is a great class. I learned a lot about English. I now can do uh, do better when I'm writing. So these are analytical reasons. But if I say for me, grammar class was a great class, you can say I had a lot of fun. I saw my friends every week. These are personal experiences. They're not things that you got. They're not conclusions. They are what you experienced in the process. Or like, um, to me, AI is a very scary thing. And then you would give reasons like, what if it does this? What if it does that? But if you say, for me, AI is a scary thing, you might then say, once when I tried to use Chad GPT, it blah, 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 and that scared me. So to me is, abstract analytical intellectual reasons and for me is personal subjective experience think about to me as being like cold hard analysis fenxi and for me is like warm kind sharing And this is especially hard for you because in Chinese, these are both dual Okay, with, uh, okay, with, uh, let's do um, of. There are two meanings of of. Either you can use it as belonging, right? Uh, let's see. The, the, Computer of the Department of Applied English. In this case, the computer belongs to the Department of Applied English. But look at this. This of. This of is not belonging. Applied English does not belong to the department. This of, we call this an a positive of. The thing before of is the same as the thing after of. It's just a different way to talk about it. Applied English is the department. The department that we're talking about is applied English. This is like an equal sign. So for example, the name of the rose. Uh, in this case, it's not saying that the rose belongs to the name. Uh, sorry, computer of. It's not saying that the name belongs to the rose. It's that saying when you use this name, you are talking about this rose. These two are the same thing. And so then you have some confusions when you say something like the love of Brian. This can mean two things. It can mean the love that belongs to Brian. So if Brian loves me, he gives me his love. Or it can mean the love that other people give Brian. Uh, so let me give you two example sentences. Amber basks in, which means enjoys the love of Brian. So Brian loves her. She enjoys this situation. Um, another example. The 
love of Brian is too much for him to handle. In this case, him equals Brian. So in this case, you might want to change this into something like the love for Brian. People love him so much he can't handle it. Like uh, think of Taylor Swift. She's so famous that she can't go anywhere without being like mobbed by crowds of people with cell phones. It's too much for him to handle. Next one with with means having. Or using. I took it with my hands, so this means using. Um, I went there with my friends. This case means having. I have my friends with me when I go. Like together with, right? I have them there. The opposite is without. I don't have, I don't use. If I took it without my hands, that means I probably used my mouth or my feet. If I go there without my friends, that means I either went alone or I went with strangers. And then the last one here, except. Except just means except for. You can omit the for if you want. Uh, so except is the thing that is excluded. I like everything about English except or except for the grammar. So you don't like the grammar, you like everything else. Uh, I guess another way to say this is um, accepting is also OK. I think those are most of the prepositions, right? I'm thinking if I missed any. Did I forget any prepositions? Uh, well, yeah, I did, right? To. Didn't I? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I skipped the middle step and went directly to uh, applying for graduate school. So in this case, this action is the end point of the sentence. You went from like the middle step in this I'll write this up. I skipped applying for college. Right, so in this case, you skip one thing and you end up here. This is your end point. This is your end goal. So the logic is the same. Except now you're using a gerund to express an action in the form of a noun. OK, so you'll notice that in this sentence um, it's actually go to, right? So in fact, it's the same usage as above. I said go to your room. So in a lot of cases, the preposition will be decided by your verb. Um, but if you do have a choice, that's when you have to think about the meaning of these specific words. So when you learning English, the best thing to do is to pay attention to any prepositions that come after a verb and to remember the preposition with the verb. Um, but sometimes you will see 
uses of a verb plus a preposition that you have never seen before. It is not very common, and that is when you should pay attention to the meaning of the preposition. So for example, I keep saying go to. But if I say I went at him. Then you have to remember that at plus a person. Is like. Hitting somebody or arguing with somebody, right? So I went at him actually means I started to fight him. You probably won't see go plus at together very often, so when you do see it, you have to remember what the at plus person usually means. I threw it at him. I shouted at him. I went at him. All of these are offensive, attacking, violent. Does that answer your question? Great. Other questions? OK, homework. From page 32 to page 34, 32 to 34. 